Who's ready for our first section in our next unit on polynomials? I know I am, so I hope you guys are ready. So this unit, or this section, is all on an introduction to polynomials, what they are, and some characteristics about them. So let's start talking about what a polynomial is and what a monomial is. So, a monomial. Now, mono is a prefix, that means one. Okay, and monomial means it contains one term. Okay, so terms are things that do not have addition signs or minus signs. Okay, they are separated by multiplication or division, which if you see here like this 4x squared, even though it doesn't look like it, there's secretly a multiplication symbol in between them. So this is like 4 times x squared. Okay, so this is one term. Okay, so terms are separated by plus and minus signs or addition and subtraction signs. Okay, so since all these are just one term, so... This 4x squared does not have an addition or subtraction, so guess what? It is a monomial. This 3 right here is not separated by any addition or subtraction symbol, so again, it's a monomial. And also, this final term, x times y to the third times z to the fifth, or x, y to the third, z to the fifth, however you want to say it. Again, I don't see any addition or subtraction symbol, so this is also a monomial. So... Now you probably know what polynomial is, so poly is a prefix that means more than one or many. So guess what you guys, a polynomial is when you have more than one term. So it's a sum of monomials, okay, and basically all that means is it has more than one term. So we're going to be adding up more than one monomial. Holy hot dog, right? So like if we look at this first one, 2x plus 3, see how there's a plus sign right here? Okay, it is separating two separate monomials, the 2x and the 3. Okay, so this one has two terms, okay, so it is no longer a monomial. Okay, in this next one, if you see, we have a subtraction symbol and an addition symbol. And this is separating out three separate monomials. Okay, so the xy is a monomial, the 2x squared y to the third is a monomial, and the 7x is a monomial. Okay, and these are separated by addition and um, subtraction symbols, which means it is no longer a monomial, it is a polynomial. And because there are three separate monomials, this bad boy right here has three terms. Holy hot dog. So, let's keep expanding on that. So, there's different characteristics about monomials and polynomials that we need to talk about. Okay, now, there are some special names of types of polynomials that we need to go over. So some of them have special names, and we'll talk about the cases that do not have a special name. So this first one, again, a monomial like 2x, okay, it only consists of one term, okay, so there aren't any addition or subtraction symbols. Okay, a binomial, this prefix bi means two, like a bicycle has two wheels. Okay, so a a binomial has two terms. We got one monomial there and one uh, monomial there, and they're separated by an addition symbol. So this is called a binomial. Okay, a trinomial, just like a tricycle, has three terms. Okay, the 2x squared, the 3x, and the 5 by themselves are all monomials, but they are brought together with these lovely addition symbols. Okay, and that makes it three total terms, which will be called a trinomial. Now, anything larger than three terms, you guys, doesn't really have a special name. Okay, so we just call it a polynomial. Or you can classify it by, like, how many terms it has. So, like, this one is a polynomial that has four terms. So you could say a polynomial in four terms or a polynomial that contains four terms. Or just kind of describe the polynomial and how many terms there are. Okay, so anything above three does not have a special name. You just say how many terms it has, and bam, that is the name of the polynomial. So this one right here is a polynomial with four terms. Pretty neat, right? Let's keep going. Okay, so there's some other things we need to talk about. Let's specifically talk about what also makes something a polynomial, or things that we need to watch out for. So this says, a polynomial contains a whole number exponent. Okay, so let's talk about the word whole number. Whole number means, first of all, it is positive. Okay, so it's something that's positive. Okay, and it could be zero. It's okay if it has an exponent that's zero. So a whole number is positive or zero. It does not contain a fraction and is not negative. So let's talk about why when these things are not whole numbers, they are not polynomials. 
Okay, so what this means is there that there cannot be variables in the exponent, denominator, or any radicals in the expression. Guys, yeah, so the variables are in the base of kind of the, it's not an exponential, okay, but the variable is now going to be the base, and the exponent will actually be a number now. So we cannot see any exponents in, um, that contain variables. That would be an exponential, which we just talked about. Okay, and we can't see any funky symbols. Okay, also, polynomials cannot contain absolute value. So let's look at some things that are not polynomials to maybe kind of get you guys thinking about what makes something a polynomial. Okay, okay so this first one, the square root of x, even though it is an awesome function, it is not a polynomial because polynomials cannot contain any funky symbols, which include square roots. And the reason why this one has a square root is because, if you remember from your previous math class, when you have fraction exponents, they produce things like square roots. And we can't have exponents that are anything but whole numbers, which means fractions are not allowed. Okay, now this one is definitely not a polynomial because our variables cannot be in the denominator, just like it says right here. Okay, so that is crossed out, definitely not a polynomial. Okay, guys, this will be a special kind of function, which we'll look at in the next unit called a rational function. So get ready for that. Okay, so now, variables cannot be in the exponent with polynomials. A number is in the exponent. The variable is in the base of the kind of exponential-like term. Now, when the variable is in the exponent like here, that is specifically called an exponential. So, there's a difference between exponentials and polynomials. So watch yourself. And finally, the last one is not a polynomial because it's got these weird symbols. It's got these absolute value bars, which is not a polynomial. Okay, now let's talk about what degree is and what a leading coefficient is because that's going to help us as we start naming and classifying our polynomials and monomials. So the degree, you guys, basically is the sum of all the exponents in one term. Okay, so if you add up all the exponents in one term, and these are all the exponents on the variables, not on the actual numbers. Okay, so we're looking for all the variables in each term, and we're going to add up all the exponents of the variables. Okay, and again, the degree of a polynomial is classified by the term that contains the highest degree. Okay, so we're going to count up all the exponents in each term separately, basically, and whichever term has the highest, uh, highest degree, I guess, that classifies the degree of the entire polynomial. Okay, so specific terms can have degrees, as well as the whole polynomial can have a degree. Okay, so again, you add the exponents in each term, again, only on the variables, not on any numbers. Okay, and whichever term has the highest number when you add their exponents is the degree of the entire polynomial. So keep that in mind, keep that in mind. Now, a leading coefficient. Okay, once you classify which term has the highest degree, Okay, so again, when you count up all the exponents, which term has the highest number? Okay, that term, you go to the coefficient of that term, which all coefficients are, you guys, are numbers in front of the variable. So the leading coefficient is going to be the number in front of the variables that contain the highest amount of exponents when you add up all the exponents. Okay, which again, if this doesn't make sense, it'll make sense in just a moment. Now, one last thing before we start naming these polynomials. Something called standard form. So, when we write polynomials in standard form, we start with the term that contains the highest degree, and then we go to the term with the next highest degree, and then the term with the next highest degree. So, in math, we like to line things up in order. So, to get something in standard form, we start with the term with the highest degree and go all the way down to the term with the smallest degree. That's kind of what this is talking about. So this example, if we look here, okay, the degree of this first term right here, you guys, there's only one variable, okay, so I only have one exponent to add up. So my exponent of this variable is 4, and there are no other exponents on a variable, so the degree of 4x to the 4th is degree 4. If we look at this term, again, there's only one variable, which means the exponent is the degree, because there's nothing else to add it to. So this one right here is a degree 3 um, term. 
The next term, again, only one variable, so the highest exponent I see is a 2, and there's nothing to add it to. So my next term is a degree 2 term. Now this one, this one's a little tricky. This negative 5x, it does not have an exponent. But remember, when you don't see exponents, there secretly is a 1 lurking in the mix. Okay, and again, there's nothing to add it to, so that's the only exponent, which means the degree of this term is 1. And this one, you guys, actually, if you don't see a variable, the degree is actually 0 because anything to the 0 power is 1. So this is like 7 times 1, which is just 7. Now, the reason why this is in standard form, you guys, we started with the term with the highest degree, and we went all the way down to the term with the lowest degree. So this was degree 4, degree 3, degree 2, degree 1, and degree 0. Okay, and we named the entire polynomial's degree by the highest degree term, which is this one, degree 4. So this is the degree 4 polynomial and the leading coefficient. I'm going to ignore all the other terms. Okay, so to get the leading coefficient, you go to the term that has the, uh, that has the highest degree, which is 4x to the 4th, and then you just state the coefficient of that term, which is the number in front of the variable. And guess what, you guys? The number in front of the variable is 4. So the leading coefficient of this is 4. Okay, now, if this doesn't make sense, we are going to do some examples just like it, so don't fret. We will get there. Okay, now, right before we start classifying, I promise there's only one more thing. Okay, so these are kind of some examples of how we name polynomials by their degree, as well as how many terms they have. Okay, so this first one, let's start by talking about how many terms they have. So this one has one term. If you see here, there's only one thing. It's not separated by any addition or any subtraction. So this is a, this one only contains one term. Okay, so since it contains one term, it's called a monomial. Okay, and since I don't see an exponent, secretly there is an exponent, and that is x to the zero. But remember, x to the zero is secretly a one. So this is kind of like five times one. Okay, that's why you didn't see anything because five times one is just five. Okay, so if you don't see a variable, you guys, rule of thumb, it is called a degree zero, and degree zeros are called constant functions, always. Okay, so let's keep going. Okay, the next one, let's talk about how many terms it has. It says it has two. Now, let's talk about why. There's a term right there, and there's a term right there. So holy hot dog, you guys, there's only two terms. And remember, the special name for two terms is a binomial. Okay, and the highest exponent you see is our degree, okay, and again, this first one is a degree 1 because secretly, if I don't see an exponent, there secretly is a 1, and the degree of this term, you guys, is 0 since I don't have an exponent, okay, so the highest degree term is this one, and the degree is 1, so the entire polynomial is degree 1, and the special name for degree 1 is linear. All right, and guys, all these just contain one variable, Okay, so basically, rule of thumb, if your whatever your highest exponent is, is the degree of the entire polynomial. Now, when you start getting more than one variable in each term, it's different. But see how all of these have just one x in every single term? So if you ever see that, rule of thumb, the name of the degree of the polynomial is the highest exponent. All right, let's talk about the next one. So we have one term, so it's called a monomial, and the highest exponent is 2. So it's degree 2, which is called a quadratic. Okay? Next up. Okay, we got three terms in this one. One right there, one right there, and one right there. So we got three terms, which is called a trinomial. Okay, and the highest exponent term you see is a 3. So this is a degree 3. Okay, and if you want to put these together, you guys, you say it's a degree 3 trinomial or a cubic trinomial. So we name things by their degree and how many terms they have. This is a constant monomial. This is a linear binomial. This is a quadratic monomial. Okay, now this one, you guys, has two terms, bam and bam. So it's a binomial. And since the highest exponent you see is a 4, it is a quartic. So this is a quartic binomial. And finally, we got four terms in this last one. Bam, 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 bam. Okay, remember you guys, there's not a special name for four terms. So this is just called a polynomial of four terms. And since the highest exponent we see is a 5, 
This is a degree 5, which is called a quintic. So this is a quintic polynomial of four terms. Because once you get past degree 5, there are not any special names. Okay, so we got constant, linear, quadratic, cubic, quartic, and quintic. Okay, after that, we don't really name it by the degree anymore. We just say like degree 7, degree 8, degree 20, whatever the highest exponent is, when there's only one exponent in each term and one variable. Okay, that is the name of the polynomial. All right, but in our example problems we're about to look at, okay, sometimes, like if you see in this one, there are more than one variable in each of these terms, which means... The degree is not the highest exponent. We have to add all the exponents to get the degree of the actual term. Okay, which if that doesn't make sense, you guys, we will definitely go over this in just a moment. So, in our example problems 1, 2, and 3, we're going to determine if the following are polynomials because some of these may or may not be a poly polynomial or a monomial. Okay, but if they are a polynomial or monomial, we will write them in standard form, classify them by their number of terms degree, and state the leading coefficient. It's going to be awesome, you guys. So go ahead, pause the video, and watch example problems 1, 2, and 3. Okay, this is something we're going to do in class to kind of think kind of the reverse way. So I'm going to give you a scenario what the degree is and how many terms it should have and you're going to come up with your own. But you'll have to wait wait for that until class time. Okay. So let's talk about types of roots and how many roots polynomials have. Now before we do that we need to talk about some special types of roots that we will be discovering. Okay. So if you guys see here roots or zeros or x-intercepts Okay, these are all the same things, which basically say, how many times does the graph touch the x-axis? Okay, that tells you how many zeros there are, or how many roots there are, or how many x-intercepts there are, or how many zeros there are. Okay, all these things mean the same thing, you guys. Okay, now this one is a special case, though. You're probably like, Miss Long, this touches the graph one time, right there. Touches the x-axis once. Well, we need to talk about this. Do you guys see how the graph doesn't just cross through that x value and keep going? It kind of comes down and boing, it kind of bounces off. Do you guys see that? Okay, when a graph comes down and just touches it and goes away from it, does not actually cross through it, this is called the graph being tangent at a zero. Okay, and when it does that, the zero actually counts twice. Yes, that's what I said. When it comes down and touches the zero and goes away from it or bounces off of it, Okay, this is a double root and counts two times. Okay, so this one, this graph right here, actually has two x-intercepts or two zeros or two roots. Okay, because it comes down and it kind of bounces off the zero. It doesn't actually cross through the zero. Okay, so this crosses through and counts twice, which is called a double root. Guys, okay, so the solution here, it has two solutions, which are in fact the same thing, it just counts twice. So we have a double root at x equals 1, which means our two roots are x equals 1 and equals 1. Okay, so we only have one solution, you guys, because they are the same exact number, x equals 1, x equals 1, but there are actually two roots. So one actual answer, but two roots. Okay, let's keep going. Now, there's something else to look out for. When you guys see something that looks like this, okay, this right here, okay, it kind of looks like it's touching a bunch of the x-axis. So it looks like it touch the, touches the x-axis from here all the way to here. Well, that is actually not what is going on in this graph. What happens is the graph gets really close to the x-axis, but it does not touch the x-axis until it hits the origin. Okay, so right in here and right in here, it gets really, really close to the x-axis, but it does not touch. Okay, so it only, in fact, touches it once. Okay, so if you guys see the graph kind of behave like this, it actually only has one zero or one root or one x-intercept. Remember, all those mean the same thing. So be on the lookout for that. All right, as we're going to do an activity in class that pertains to how many zeros or roots or x-intercepts polynomials will have, and it actually relates to the, to the degree. Okay, so we are going to do an activity on this in class. Okay, which if you have not done the activity yet, this will ruin the surprise. So I hope you have done the activity. 
Okay, so after we did the wonderful activity discovering how many roots or zeros or x-intercepts a polynomial has, you found out that the largest amount of real roots that a polynomial has is equal to the degree. Okay, so the most zeros you can see on a graph equals the degree of the polynomial. Isn't that cool, you guys? Okay, let's keep going. Now, there is some other rule, which I did not label here, but it is called the Fundamental Theorem of Algebra, which states the total amount of roots is equal to the degree. Okay, which kind of sounds like this in a way, but not really, because this says the largest amount of real roots is equal to the degree, which means it doesn't have to equal the degree. So let's talk about what this means. Okay, so if we look down here. Okay, it says how many roots and what kind of roots does a degree to quadratic have? Okay, well degree 2 means it can have at most two real roots. Okay, but this right here said that the total number of roots is equal to the degree. But if I look here, you guys, to know how many zeros or roots or x-intercepts the graph has, it must, it must touch the x-axis. Which if you see here, you guys, this graph never touches the x-axis. But since it's a quadratic, which is degree 2, it's supposed to touch it twice. So what's going on? Okay, currently there are zero real roots. But maybe, just maybe, there are some other nifty roots that will allow it to have two roots. Maybe they're not real roots, though. So let's talk about that. Okay, so there are these things called imaginary roots, or imaginary zeros that do exist, but you cannot see them on a graph. Okay, so basically, you guys, if you have a graph, count up all the real roots, okay, and whatever's left over will be the imaginary roots. And basically, if you add up all the real roots and all the imaginary roots, they will, in fact, equal the degree. Okay, so all the missing roots that you don't see on the graph are actually your imaginary roots. So, like, if I look back at this problem, you guys, there are zero real roots, but since this is a degree 2 polynomial, it must have a total of two roots. Okay, so zero plus what gives me two roots? Well, zero plus two, which means this graph has two imaginary roots, which is pretty cool. Okay, which if that doesn't make sense, it'll probably make sense when we do these lovely example problems. So go ahead and pause the video, watch example four and five, and you will find out how to find out how many real and how many imaginary roots your graphs will have. Okay. So example six, we're moving on to some other characteristics of the graph. Okay, what we're going to look at first is where does the graph increase or decrease? Now, to know where the graph increases or decreases, you need to trace your graph from left to right. And when you do that, if you go up with your pencil when you trace, that is in fact an increase because you're headed upward. If you go down with your pencil when you trace left to right, that is going to be a decrease. Guys, yeah, so I'm starting here, I'm tracing my pencil, I'm headed upward, so from here to here, the graph is going to be increasing. Bam. So if I keep going from here to here, from left to right, I'm kind of going downhill, so this would be a decrease. From here to here, I'm tracing the left to right, I'm kind of headed upwards, which means it's an increase. Okay, and then right here, when I trace from left to right, I'm kind of heading downward again. Okay, which means it would be a decrease. And lastly, when I trace left to right from here here, I am headed upwards, which means I am increasing. Okay, now, for example six, what you're going to find out is how to state intervals of increase and decrease. So we kind of have a visual representation right here of when the graph increases or decreases, but we're going to state the x values where the graph increases and decreases, and we're going to be using that interval notation, so get pumped up. So go ahead and pause the video and watch example six. All right, so example seven is pretty much the same as example six, so if you'd like to, you can try example seven on your own. You're going to be finding the intervals of increase and decrease. Holy hot dog, this is so much fun. Okay, so go ahead and pause the video. If you think you got it, try it on your own and fast forward to the end of example seven, or you can follow along. All right, and this is a funsy, so you'll have to wait for class time in order to do this one. All right, so 
We are now going to talk about some characteristics of even degree functions, so degree 2, 4, 6, etc., and odd degree functions, so degree 1, degree 3, degree 5. Okay, which if you guys look down here, I've kind of labeled how many real or how many real zeros each of the graphs have, not the amount of imaginary, so be careful. So if you see here, I've labeled degree 1 has one real root. Degree 3 could have three real roots or one real root. Degree 5 could have five real roots, three real roots, or two or one real root. Sorry. So one thing you guys should notice with odd degrees, so our degree 1, degree 3, and degree 5, these all have an odd amount of real zeros. Okay? So that's something to keep in mind. Also, with your odd degrees, you guys, do you notice that the arrows are po pointing in opposite directions? One of them points up and one of them points down. If you look here, one points up and one points down. And again, one points up and one points down. So when you guys have an odd degree function, your arrows will point in opposite directions. Isn't that cool, you guys? Okay, and let's look at our even degree functions. So we have a degree 2 right here and a degree 4. Okay, a degree 2 graph could have two real roots or zero real roots. And a degree 4 graph could have four real roots, two real roots, or zero real roots. Okay, so if you notice, even degrees have an even amount of real roots, including zero, which is pretty cool. Also, if you guys notice with your even degree graphs, your arrows point in the same direction. So like here, both of these arrows are pointing upward. Okay, if you look here, they're both also pointing upward now. They could also both be pointing downward. So that's something to keep in mind when you're looking at even and odd degree functions. Okay, let's keep going. All right, so our final two example problems of this first introduction to polynomial section. Okay, this is actually going to be kind of a review of when we added and subtracted with function notation. It's actually very similar. Okay, so example eight, we have this polynomial added to another polynomial, which... If you think back to when we did function a function notation with addition, okay, basically we combine like terms. So that's all we're going to do with this. Okay, so go ahead and pause the video and watch example 8. This is the funsy, so hold your horses. We'll do that later in class. Example 9, our final example problem. Okay, so we're going to, we're going to be subtracting two nifty polynomials, which... If you think back to when we did function notation and subtracted, it's actually very similar. Okay, which, if you pause the video right now and watch example 9, you will see how similar this is to when we subtracted using function notation. Okay, so go ahead and pause the video, watch example 9. Okay, this will be the funsy that we do in class, so you'll have to wait on it. Alright guys, it's been totally awesome. I've had so much fun. 